I hadn't seen that. <laughs> All right, slide. Uh, <laughs> good morning. Um, my name is Sarah, and um, I'm doing the part of the service today where I get to talk to you about the Bible. I want to introduce myself because I don't work here, so some of you don't know me. Um, my full name is Sarah Sigmund. I'm a third grade teacher. I've been a public school teacher for 15 years. I'm married. My husband does work here. His name is Jonathan. He's the executive pastor. <laughs> And we have two little kids. They're in uh, first and third grade. So, like I said, I'm a teacher, and I love my job. I love my job all the years, but this year I really love my job. I have a really wonderful class, and I feel really lucky to have the job I have because I like going to work. But I also like not going to work in July and August because that is also part of being a teacher, is that you have the summer off. So we have our whole family looks forward to summer, and we have things that we do in the summer that um, we don't have time to do during the school year. Like we'll go mini golfing. Um, half our family is competitive. Half our family is really not competitive, but looks forward to the ice cream at the end. I'll let you figure out which where the lines fall on that one. Um, we have friends, really good friends, who took us this summer out on a boat for the first time. It was the first time our kids had ever done that. That was like a highlight of their summer, the, um, the boat and the tubing, and that was really, really fun. Um, and then every summer, we go camping. And I've got the camping system down to an art where it takes exactly 18 hours because we arrive like prior to dinner and cook the hot dogs and don't sleep for one night. And then we are at said camping location until mid-afternoon the following day, by which point I can come home, take a shower, and order a pizza. And, and we go with another family, which are really great friends of ours who do most of the work. So, uh, but if you ask the Sigmund children, we camp every summer. So our family loves summer, and we have certain things that we look forward to as a family. But because I've been teaching for so long, I've also developed like traditions for myself that I do every summer. Um, every summer, I reread one of the Jane Austen books. My favorite, the one I recommend if you're just starting with Jane Austen, is Persuasion. She's my favorite lead character. Her name is Anne Elliot. And every summer, I read through one of the Gospels um, on my own in my personal quiet time. And my favorite gospel is Luke, which is not the one we're doing, but that's okay. I really like Matthew too. And I was really excited that we were doing it. And I started this several years ago where I would, after school let out, start one of the gospels and read all the way through it. And when I did that, I was struck by a few things that I expected would be one way. And when I read it piece by piece, they were a different way. For example, I thought all the stories in the gospel were pretty simple and straightforward, but as it turns out, I had just been skipping the confusing ones, like the fig tree story. Still don't get that one. I expected that I would see Jesus get angry when people did sinful things. But mostly in the gospels, when Jesus gets angry, it's at religious people who are making a lot of rules and excluding others. And I expected that most of the teachings of Jesus would be like theological sermons, you know, where he explains the mysteries of God and spiritual topics. And I was really surprised by how many of the teachings of Jesus in the gospels are actually really practical teachings of like instructions about how we are supposed to live our life on earth. And that created a little bit of like attention for me because I was really comfortable with the church idea that Jesus is my savior. The name Jesus means to save or to rescue. And the rescue mission of Jesus made sense to me. I understood that Jesus lived a perfect life on earth to show us God, that he was offering forgiveness, that he lost his life and then came back to life to demonstrate that God is stronger than death, and that was done. That was a closed theological circle for me. And that story is in the gospel. But when I read them straight through a piece at a time, I ended up finding that that theological doctrine isn't the topic for all of Jesus's sermons. 
And the people who knew Jesus and listened to him didn't call him savior, they called him teacher. Many of the teachings were actually about how to live in the kingdom of God on earth. One pastor says that Jesus came to show us a new way to be human. So then I was stuck with a question for myself. Because I'm a follower of Jesus, am I treating Jesus as the one who will save me when I mess up? Or am I listening to Jesus as my teacher for how I'm supposed to be living my life now? So the Bible, we call it a book, but the Bible is really more like an anthology. Like it has a lot of different books inside of it and they're all different genres. There's historical accounts and poetry and there is some theological nonfiction books and there's biographies and that's what the gospel is. It's a biography of Jesus. So it's the historical account of this real life person, the things that happened to him, the things he said and the things he thought. So we're reading Matthew through as a church If you were here for the last few weeks, we already talked about the events of Jesus's early life. And last week, Pastor Rob talked about the Beatitudes where Jesus was teaching. And we're kind of coming in right there. So if you imagine like you walked into my classroom in the middle of math, that's what we're doing. We're walking into the middle of a lesson from Jesus. And if you wanna follow along in your Bible or on your phone, I'm gonna be in Matthew chapter five and we're starting on verse 17, but it will also be on the screen. So this is Jesus talking, and this is right in the middle of his lesson. Jesus says, "'Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished.'" Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So what Jesus called the law and the prophets, we would call the rules the rules that are in the Old Testament, the guidelines for how to live. And Jesus said, I did not come to abolish them. I've come to fulfill them because the guidelines of God were actually never the problem. Our inability to keep them has always been the problem. The guidelines of God were good. It was the fact that we couldn't keep them. That's where the breakdown was. Now, personally, I like rules. Rules are my friend. Rules make things orderly and they keep people I love safe. And even before uh, the part of the Bible where Jesus is born, the Bible does have a lot of rules, but they're the kind of rules that if, if people had followed them, would have created a human civilization like nothing the world has ever seen. Here's some of the examples of the rules of God. Never take anything that doesn't belong to you. Never take a human life rest every week, accommodate the weak and the poor so that nobody goes without. Who wouldn't wanna live in a world like that? The guidelines weren't the problem, it was that we couldn't keep them. And so Jesus is telling his listeners, I did not come to remove those, they're not going anywhere. He said he came to fulfill it and to fulfill it means to show what it was supposed to look like. The life of Jesus is what the guidelines of God looked like when a human lived them out. In school, we call this modeling. So like next week, my students have been writing stories and next week they're gonna learn about writing an introduction that's really interesting and makes their reader wanna read them, which in their current state, no one wants to read them. So we're, we're hopeful this will go well. So. They're going to learn um, leads in an introduction. And that process will go with, they'll come back and we'll talk about it. And I'll explain different ways you can write an introduction to a story. And then I have a story and I'm going to do it while they watch. I'm going to write an introduction for my story and think out loud what I'm doing. And then they're going to go back to their seats and try it. Because we, when we can watch someone do it really well, then we can imagine ourselves doing it really well. When Jesus came and lived out the guidelines of God on earth, then we could see what it looked like. That's Jesus fulfilling the law and the prophets. He wasn't taking down the guidelines. 
He was showing us what they looked like. And he was expanding on them in case it wasn't bad enough that we flopped the first time. And this is where I think Jesus is talking in this passage directly as a teacher. And I understood always from when I was little that Jesus was going to forgive me because he was a savior. And in this passage, I had to understand that Jesus isn't just a savior, Jesus is a teacher. And so what we're gonna read today are the teachings of Jesus because if you are a follower of Jesus, then the teachings of Jesus are meant to be learned and lived out by his followers. And they can't be ignored if we really wanna follow him faithfully. But the process of learning takes time and work. You have to actually get these lessons into your brain and things don't come into our brain through osmosis. I know some of you slept with your biology book under your pillow and it did nothing. Content has to be read or heard and then processed and then it has to be applied to our lives and that's what we do with the teachings of Jesus that we find here in the Bible. So we're gonna go over some of them today. Brace yourself. First, Jesus taught that we should be in control of our anger, not let our anger control us. Here are his words. You have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel. Whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. See, uncontrolled anger gets used as an excuse for why certain actions were taken. And those words that come out in our anger People use them as weapons to hurt the person they're talking to. And Jesus is teaching that that is wrong. And it's incredible as a, as a society that after all this time and all this study of psychology, we still devalue the damage that we do when we speak in anger. Anger is also a secondary emotion. So when you're speaking out of anger, there was something underneath that. Anger is the emotion that we recognize and it tends to be the one we react to. But if you're really, really sad and you ignore that for a long time, it will explode in anger. Or if you're really, really hurt and you don't deal with that for a long time, it'll simmer up and it'll come out as angry bitterness. Followers of Jesus have to learn to deal with anger in healthy ways or we we will hurt people. Jesus taught his followers that using another person for sex, even in your mind, was a violation of that other person. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off, throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. So uh, language like this makes me very uncomfortable because we were just having a nice talk about anger and now all of a sudden we're talking about sex and chopping out people's eyeballs and hell. And, um, and you might be wondering if this is a really weird, like shame-based cult that you wandered into where thinking about sex or wanting to have sex is gonna disqualify you from following God. No. The Bible is not anti-sex. The Bible is pro-healthy sex. And people who are totally governed by their own desires and what they want To fulfill those desires, they end up violating the safety and the desires of other people. We know that from stories that are in scripture, a lot of the Old Testament is not appropriate for children because it's people who did not have control of their sexuality. And we know that from watching the news, that if your main object is fulfilling your desires, you'll end up violating the safety and desires of another person. And you know, putting boundaries around something is not declaring it bad. We put the boundaries around anything we consider valuable, like think about a home security system. We protect what is of value to us. 
And Jesus even went after people's thoughts because there's a correlation between thoughts without self-control and actions without self-control. What starts in your mind will eventually expand to your life. And so Jesus is teaching that for followers of him, even thoughts that don't respect somebody else's sexual integrity are wrong. Jesus taught his followers to be committed to their marriages and not to walk away lightly. Jesus said, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Okay, I want you to imagine that for a second, because consider how it worked in that culture. A man could literally hand his wife a piece of paper and with that one action completely reject her. If you have survived the ending of a marriage, or if someone you love has survived the ending of a marriage, then I don't have to explain to you how deeply that pain and how unique it is in somebody's heart and mind. Abandonment, rejection, lies, anger, financial stress, shame, co-parenting, court. There are a lot of casualties in the battles that end a marriage. And this teaching of Jesus was meant to emphasize to his followers that the marriage promises we make are really serious and decisions to end a marriage shouldn't be made casually by passing off a piece of paper because the person on the other side of that paper is deeply loved by Jesus too. Now this specific teaching, that little part I just read, more than um, some other parts I think, has been used in really oppressive ways. It's been a really heavy burden on people who were in unsafe and really deeply unhealthy situations. It's created a lot of guilt and extra suffering for followers of Jesus who are also survivors of divorce. And I think it's made people question if God's grace really would extend to a second chance for them, for redemption and for a new marriage relationship. And that's why it's important to read the, the lessons of Jesus for yourself and to understand what he was teaching and what he was not teaching. Jesus didn't say that divorce is the worst thing a Christian can do. Jesus didn't say that divorce disqualifies you from literally anything in the kingdom of God. He's teaching that marriage commitments for followers of Jesus are serious promises and they're meant to be lifelong. Jesus taught us to tell the truth. Again, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath on your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So ever since forever, people try to avoid, find ways to avoid being totally honest. That's the, I crossed my fingers. Or like a kid once told me, I crossed my toes. I was like, you're wearing shoes, stupid. That doesn't count. Um, or uh, more famously, I deliberately misled you. Or grownups will say, well, I told a half truth or it was a white lie. And so Jesus was teaching that his followers should be so honest that it's actually simple. No complicated excuses, no half-truths, yes, no. If we were that honest, that would make us, as followers of Jesus, the most trustworthy people on earth, if we told the truth that cleanly. Jesus taught his followers that in place of revenge, we were supposed to show generosity. Jesus said, you've heard it said that an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. 
If anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow. So revenge, revenge is a natural human response. It's not something we have to teach. Trust me, I work with eight-year-olds. The natural response for any human being who is wronged is to strike back. A very impressive response when you are wronged is to demonstrate enough self-control to walk away without harming that person. The Jesus response is to stay and show generosity to that exact person. And I don't have a nice story or an idea for that one because that is really terribly hard. The greatest example that I could think of for that is gonna come 20 chapters later in the book of Matthew, when Jesus, the teacher himself, is slapped and physically assaulted and is unjustly accused and charged in a ridiculous court and is betrayed by his best friends and then murdered in a public and painful way. And Jesus follows his own teaching in the most beautiful way that humanity could never have imagined on our own, right up to that very last breath, staying with us and loving us. So that, that's just a few of the lessons from Jesus the teacher on how we were supposed to live on this planet as his followers. Control your anger. Don't violate another person for your sexual desire, even in your mind. Honor your marriage commitment. Tell the truth. Show generosity in place of revenge. So I think a fair question or a good question to ask is what happens when we get that right? Those things. What happens when we take the time to learn the lessons that Jesus taught and we actually live them? Well, first, the natural consequence is we end up having healthier connection with God and we end up having healthier connection with each other. That's just a very natural consequence. The, the guidelines in the Bible were always designed to create the healthiest connection between humans and humans and God. If we could have relationships without lies and relationships without revenge and uncontrolled anger, we all want that. We just don't live the way that gets us there sometimes. But here's another thing that happens when we get it right. Other people can see Jesus when they look at us. See, Jesus came to earth so that we could see what God is like. Um, in Hebrews it says, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. When we look at Jesus, we can see what God is like. When we live the way Jesus taught us to live, other people can see what Jesus is like. And Jesus is magnetic to the human soul. And I think for the church, and I'm talking capital C church, like worldwide followers of Jesus, I think for the church right now, this one is really big because I think we're still operating from the idea that what people want or need from us is for us to go out there and tell them what we believe. But um, times are changing and we live in the information age. So for better or for worse, if people are looking for information, they aren't calling their friends or searching out an expert or getting a book from the library, they're asking Google. And I am not saying that that's the most accurate way to get information in life, but especially about faith, I am saying that people may not initially seek you out for information about Christianity or about Jesus, or about faith. But what Google can never replace is the lived out masterpiece of a human life that has been redeemed by grace and is committed to Jesus. And when we follow Jesus as our teacher, when we get this right, when we actually live this way, this is fascinating to a culture that is exhausted because Jesus is our teacher, but culture has their teachers too. They don't call them teachers, they call them like influencers or gurus or movement leaders or whatever their vocabulary is, but that's their teachers. And the teachers 
of modern Western culture right now want everybody to achieve something or buy something or, or defeat the other camp or be really, really clever. And that's not what it looks like when your teacher is Jesus. And when you live the lessons of Jesus, that looks incredibly appealing to exhausted people who are trying to follow their teachers. So sharing our faith, sharing Jesus in the information age starts from a different point because we're not starting necessarily by presenting information. What we're doing is having these daily opportunities to present just a different way of living, a different teacher to listen to. And it's really interesting for our friends who are looking for peace and for freedom. And what it ends up creating is maybe not lessons for you to teach, but conversations that you can have about faith and invitations where you can bring people to places where they can see the real Jesus. So that's, that's part of what can happen when we get it right, but it's also fair to ask what happens when we get it wrong. So when I told my friend this was the section I was teaching on, and I was excited, my friend was like, oh yeah, I know that part, always makes me feel like a failure. And that's reasonable. And one of the verses I read in verse 20, Jesus said, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. A couple verses later, Jesus said, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And then the apostle Paul writing, um, he said in Romans, I do not understand my own actions. I do not do what I want. I do the very thing I hate. Sometimes even when we know it, we get it wrong. And statements like the ones I just read are terrifying for me when I like reflect honestly on my life. The Christian word for righteousness is like a, it's just a word that means like my track record of right living. So my track record of right living, my righteousness has some really dark spots on it and places where I failed. And when Jesus says perfect like your heavenly father, nope, I can't in even see perfect in the distance. And some of you know me really well or have known me for a really long time and you're coughing into your elbows right now because they let me come up here and talk about anger and name calling. <laughs> because even, even when I know that Jesus is my teacher and I learn the lessons and I'm trying really hard to live that way, I'm not really there. And I'm a failure at a lot of this, and I feel it really acutely. And I told you when I started that I learned from reading the Gospels that Jesus isn't just a savior, Jesus is a teacher. But thankfully, Jesus wasn't just a teacher, Jesus is a savior. And so if someone's your savior, they have to save you from something. So what did Jesus save me from? Jesus saved me from me because I'm not the person I wanna be, and I don't get it right. And people think that if there were no rules, they'd feel free. But actually, the absence of rules doesn't create freedom. The complete absence of rules creates chaos. Freedom comes to me because Jesus gave me forgiveness. That's what made me free. Jesus is my savior, and that freedom, that forgiveness, that makes me brave enough to try again when I missed the mark. That's what Jesus saved me from. And this is kind of like a both true moment that Jesus isn't like a, a pick one. Jesus isn't your savior or your teacher. Jesus is both. He's the teacher who taught us the greatest lessons on how to be human. And he's the savior who rescues us from ourselves when we don't live that way. Everybody, all of you and me, naturally lean to one way or another. So some of you naturally lean towards understanding that Jesus is your teacher and you like reading his lessons and you're really good at knowing what the Bible teaches about how to live. So if that's you, ask yourself what steps would help you understand better that Jesus is also your savior. What quiet times of prayer or minutes that you spent meditating on the Psalms would help you remember that Jesus is your loving rescuer, even when you violate what you knew to do. 
And if you naturally lean towards understanding Jesus as your savior, like you really connect to the idea that Jesus is spiritually close to you and he's forgiven you and redeemed you, here's the thought for you. We are gonna be in Matthew all this year and this passage alone was full of the lessons of Jesus on how to live and there's a lot more. So what steps would help you understand Jesus as your teacher? Not just to experience his love, but to understand the way that he wanted us to live. Because the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke especially, are full of the teachings of Jesus. Could you spend some time reading those and considering how to apply them to your actual real life? And could you journal a little bit about that process and what the teachings of Jesus mean for you? What did Jesus teach about how to be human that would bring a lot more health and freedom into your life? So the worship team can come back out. This, when I was talking, when I was thinking about this, it made me remember several years ago, maybe like eight years ago, I had a couple kids in my class that were extremely smart, really, really bright little girls. And so the school paid for me to have these consulting hours with a person who specialized in gifted and talented education. And this person would come in throughout the year in like two hour increments and meet with me and look at the kids' work samples and talk to me about how to be a good teacher for them. And he told me that when I I had me make a profile of the kids learning, like their different areas and what they were good at. And he said, you know, everybody thinks when you have a gifted and talented child, you need to take their special talent and develop that. And he was like, that's actually not the best strategy because this little girl was a really gifted writer. He was like, she's going to grow in that. That's her passion area. She will chase that down on her own. You as her teacher need to find her weakest area and strengthen that. Because when you do that, you're gonna lift her as a learner and thinker across the board. You'll elevate her entire capacity if you go after where she's weakest. And I think it's the same thing to think about. If you naturally lean towards understanding Jesus as a teacher and following his rules, what can you lean into to understand Jesus as your savior? How can you strengthen your weakest point? And if you come from the church place where you know a lot about Jesus as your savior, what can he teach you? What can you learn from him about how to live? Following Jesus is a really interesting thing because it starts really, really personal. Like it starts with a commitment that you make that you're gonna accept God's grace and live his way. But then it goes way beyond yourself and it affects the choices you make and the way you treat other people and everything about your life. And it's not really that easy or simple, but it is really that worth it. So I gave a few suggestions practically on either side, whichever you find yourself. And now I'm gonna give you a couple seconds to think. Where does your tendency lean? And what do you still need to learn?